Our Bible readings taken from two places. First of all, from the Gospel of John, just a few verses from chapter 16. John's Gospel, chapter 16, verse 12 through to verse 15. And then we're going to read the whole of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. John chapter 16 and verse 12, Jesus says, I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. And then from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. When I came to you, brethren, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God in lofty words or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in much fear and trembling, and my message and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That your faith might rest, that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it's not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God which God decreed before the ages for our glorification. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man conceived, what God has prepared for those who love him. God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For what person knows a man's thoughts except the Spirit of the man which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is from God that we might understand the gifts bestowed on us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who possess the Spirit. The unspiritual man does not receive the gifts of the Spirit, does not receive the gifts of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual man judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the, the, mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And may the Spirit come and guide us into all of that truth. 
Now we'll be... Do you see in the first instance now why a sword is such an appropriate simile? Outside or above the Old Bailey, the Court of Criminal Justice in London, there is the figure with the scales in one hand and the sword in the other. The emblem of justice and equity and the emblem of authority. And that sword of authority must stand over our lives to guide us today into all truth. Now, when we became Christians, we were not required in that early day to believe that the Bible is entirely truthful. That was not a condition of entry into the kingdom. We simply came trusting in Jesus. But if we are going to grow as believers, if we are going to go on to maturity, that will depend in no small measure on the way that we take this book and let it be the sword of authority over our lives. That we let it speak to us in every area. That we let it be our map and our guide So then, the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. He is its author. And he invests it with his great authority. The sword of the Spirit was written by the Spirit. That's the first thing that I want to draw from that phrase. And the second is this. Not only is the Spirit the author of the sword, but he is the interpreter of the sword. And here we turn for the second of the passages of Scripture that we read earlier. To 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and I just want to read maybe four of the verses. First of all, from verse 3. Paul, writing to the Corinthians, says, I was with you in weakness and much fear and trembling. My speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. The New International Version has perhaps not done us a favor by simply saying, I think, in demonstration of the Spirit's power, sort of eliding all the words together. But the Revised Standard says, in demonstration of the Spirit and power, distinct, distinct entities, this, the demonstration and the power, that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And then secondly from verse 14, the unspiritual man doesn't receive the gifts of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Now, two people can be sitting together. They can have been reading the same passage of the Bible. Or they can have been hearing the same passage of the Bible explained and expounded to them. And they can turn to each other after the, the, the occasion, the meeting, the service, and they can be talking about what they've heard. And one of them remarks, didn't that passage come to you with clarity? And the other looks at his friend with an expression of amazement. Because for him, what he heard was just a jumble of sentences and disconnected ideas. 
and it meant nothing to them to him now any difference in the intelligence the iq of the two hearers had nothing to do with the way that what he heard or what he read was received that was not the factor the thing that was present in one of the readers in one of the listeners and what was so sadly lacking in the other was this interpretation by the holy spirit what we sometimes call the inner testimony the way that the spirit takes the word of god and brings it home the spirit of god becomes spectacles so that what we cannot read clearly he makes clear another way of looking at it could be the spirit of god becomes a spotlight which he shines on the word so that what we haven't seen but dimly suddenly comes into shining light he becomes an inner testifier now you'll see in verse 4 that the, i what i pointed out there are two different elements here there is first of all the element of demonstration that's a word that paul has taken from the law courts it really means a piece of evidence now supposing this supposing i will want to dig a tunnel under the irish sea to make it easier for us to go to our friends across the water and you know i might have to go to some lens to prove my point that it was a good idea and there would be the most enormous court of inquiry and there would be uh, people giving evidence against what i'm doing saying that it was the most appalling suggestion and i would bring my evidence i would rally all that i could to my argument to suggest that here is something worthwhile but of course i wouldn't do it by myself i would bring a corroborator i would bring an expert in the field of channel tunneling i would bring someone from the environmental works who would tell us here is reasons why we should do it this way i would bring expertise to bear now the the scriptures come to us with arguments forceful arguments but they don't stand by themselves they also bring this great corroborator this a sister this one who testifies on the scriptures behalf the spirit comes in with a demonstration and he brings illumination to our hearts in this way but more than that we're told that he does it with power when paul wrote about the thessalonians he thanked god because the gospel had come to them not in word only but in power and in the holy spirit and in full conviction the spirit came with power into their lives now this i put to you brethren in the lord is one of the great needs that we have it's a perpetual miracle that we need to keep on going on in our lives this is what we need when we come to study the word and without it all our bible reading will be a tedious ritual without it biblical ministries will fossilize without it christians go to sleep this 
testifying this inner writing of the Spirit in our hearts is something I say again that we keep on needing all the days of our pilgrimage. When the Spirit does this, it doesn't make Bible study unnecessary. It's not an alternative to Bible study, this inner work of the Holy Spirit. Rather, this is what ignites our Bible study. This is what sets the word on fire. This is what brings fire to the altar of our lives. Do you know, I think there are many Christians who are like gleaming motor cars. They look very fine from the outside. And you open the bonnet and you see, yes, all the components are there and the parts have been assembled in the right order. But the one thing that is missing is the internal combustion. There isn't any fire when it comes to studying and reading and listening to the Word of God. Remember what Cleopas said and his friend after they'd been with the Lord Jesus at Emmaus. Didn't our hearts burn within us as he spoke to us on the way while he opened to us the scriptures. Now, what was that burning? It was an emotional upsurge, I'm sure. But it was more than an upsurge. It was a branding, yes, a branding of the word onto the hearts of these men so that God's truth was indelibly printed on their characters. Now, let me close by just suggesting three ways in which I think this will affect our lives and affect our attitude to the Scriptures. First of all, it will affect the way that we listen. It will affect the way that we listen. Return with me again to the simile of the sword. It's the writer to the Hebrews who describes the word as sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow and discerning the thoughts of the heart. It's this penetrative work of the spirit which will be very, very evident to the good listener and to the attentive reader. Do we come to the word, my friends, ready and willing for this piercing, penetrative work of the sword? Do we come to the word ready for him to cut out the tumors from inside our characters? Do we come to the word ready for the spirit to amputate what is unwanted? The word of God has our heart-searching power ransacking and rifling our consciences. Are we listening, ready for that kind of ministry inside? How do you listen? How do you read? It's sadly possible. It's sadly possible for the word to be like a, one of these swords in the stately homes of our countries. Very beautiful. 
but only adorning the walls. Never really out of its sheath. Never really doing the work for which it was intended. How we can quench the Holy Spirit simply by the way that we listen or rather by the way that we only half listen and only half-heartedly read. Well, that's the first thing. We take heed then how we hear, as Jesus said. But the second thing concerns the way that we pray. The way that we pray. You'll notice uh, in the list of uh, the armor in in Ephesians chapter 6 that the list concludes with um, the words in verse 18 of Ephesians 6, pray at all times. We're to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray at all times in the Spirit. Pray at all times in the Spirit. And he goes on in verse 19 to say, pray also for me that utterance may be given me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. We are encouraged to pray for the word, to pray for the work of the word in our hearts. The Father promises, as he said, to give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. If you then, being evil, he says, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? And in prayer, one of our great concerns will be to ask for the Holy Spirit working in the Word. He will come by asking. And we will want, both in our own homes and when we meet Saturday by Saturday, to pray for this accompanying work of the Holy Spirit. Here among us as we meet on Sundays. To do that same work in those fellowships that we have a particular link with up and down the land and across the globe. That the sword and the spirit may be working together. So that there may be an anointed utterance. And the measure that we pray for this, I'm sure, will be the measure that we are blessed on Sundays. Well, that's the second thing by application. It's the way not only that we listen, but the way that we pray. And the last thing that I want to leave with you is a final word, and it really is to those who are messengers. It concerns the way that we speak. It concerns the way that we speak. Now, there are many of us here who are spokesmen for Jesus in a number of capacities. Some of us are Sunday school teachers, some of us are involved in the youth groups of the, of the church, some of us are in scripture union class uh, meetings, and some of us are preachers in churches. And here is a word for us all in that category. This inner testimony of the Spirit. This is what Sunday school lessons and Sunday school teachers must cover. This is what transforms 
a mediocre talk into something explosive. This is what can take a sermon and ignite it in the hearts of the listeners. And unless this ingredient is present, the most brilliantly composed message will simply fall embarrassingly flat. Now, I want to suggest to preachers, to speakers of any kind, that there are three things, at least, that we should be praying for when we prepare a message. The first is that we will pray that we prepare the material well. That is, to use scriptural language, that we will rightly handle the word of truth that we will take what God has written and we will serve it well to the people. We will pray for the preparation of the message. The second thing that we will want to pray for is for the preparation of the messenger. That is, we will want to pray that we will be the right kind of vessels fit for the master's use, that we will be clean vessels and pure and that we will not be harboring sin so that the transcendent glory will belong to him. We will pray for the messenger. We will pray for ourselves. But, spokesman, there is a third thing that we will want to pray for. We will want to pray for this inner testimony of the Spirit. This working of the Spirit whereby he takes the sword and makes it work in the lives of the hearers. This is what Lloyd-Jones called the greatest essential in connection with preaching. Now, these are three prayers that I suggest we should be making as we prepare material. The three prayers are, of course, a unity. We cannot expect that the Spirit will anoint a message that has been slovenly prepared. Nor can we expect the Spirit to anoint a messenger whose life is clearly a lie and who is living defiantly in sin. No, the three prayers will be a unity. But this third prayer, this prayer for the coming of the Holy Spirit, by demonstration and by power is the great necessity for the preaching of the word. And what a tragedy it is when it's missing. Do you know how Jesus said to the apostles just before his ascension, he said, tarry ye in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Tarry ye in Jerusalem. Now, friends, I think that many of us should have taken that word more seriously for us. That we should have tarried in the place of prayer until we were endued with power for the preaching of the word. I don't predict many things, but I have a prediction here that when the books of the 20th century church will be opened on the last day and people will ask the question, 
Why did so many believers go off on a cul-de-sac? Especially in the realm of the public worship. That is, why have so many believers gone looking for the so-called extraordinary gifts of the Spirit in preference to all other gifts? Why have so many believers gone looking for what they would term fireworks and powerful demonstrations and signs? And I, if I'm not mistaken, if I'm not mistaken, what I think the answer will in some measure be is this. That so many came to hear the word of God. And when they heard the word of God, they found no demonstration of the spirit and of power. And that was why they went into other cul-de-sacs. And it's a message, it's a lesson rather, for those of us who are messengers and watchmen over the city walls. That we need above all else perhaps to be seeking this anointing this coming of the spirit <coughs> that he might endure us with power so I say to myself and I say to any who may be called to speak for Jesus in public <coughs> Tarry in the place of prayer until you're endued with power from on high. That is a great essential for the messengers of God. May God bless to us his word.